All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's Lunch and Learn, Captain Frederick Drinkwater, a Maine slave ship captain. We have a absolutely astounding audience with us live today, and I have a feeling we can also extend a welcome to, uh, to all the viewers who are going to watch the recording later on. We are so grateful to have you all with us today. Captain Frederick Drinkwater was born in Yarmouth, Maine and rose from relative obscurity to become one of the most notorious slave ship captains of the 1850s and early 1860s. We are so thrilled to have Dr. Kate McMahon with us today from the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Atlantic Black Box Project. Dr. McMahon is going to discuss Maine and the slave trade to Cuba in the mid 19th century, resistance to enslavement, from by African descended people, and how Captain Drinkwater and other captains like him were able to avoid any legal or social penalties for their crimes against humanity. This is actually Dr. McMahon's third Lunch and Learn with Maine Conservation Voters. We keep inviting her back because her research on Black communities in colonial New England and on the connections between Northern New England and the illegal slave trade keep blowing our minds. Kate was born and raised in Maine, and she is committed to exploring the living legacies of slavery and the slave trade in the present day, and to interpreting that history for a broad public, including us. We're grateful she's here with us today. My name is Kathleen Neal. I am the Senior Director of Policy and Partnerships here at Maine Conservation Voters and Maine Conservation Alliance. Our organizations represent more than 13,000 members and supporters dedicated to protecting Maine's environment and our democracy. MCA does that through education, collaboration, and advocacy, and MCV by influencing public policy, holding politicians accountable, and winning elections. A few technical notes for today. We'll hear from Kate first and then tackle your questions in the Q&A session at the end. You don't have to wait though, you can send those questions to me through the chat whenever they occur to you. I'll keep track of them and ask them in the session at the, following the presentation. We ask that you not message Dr. McMahon directly. We want her to be able to focus on the presentation, not the chat box. If you have any technical difficulties today, you can message Will Sedlak and he can help you out. This event is being recorded and the video will be posted on our website later this afternoon, where you can also find recordings of all of our previous Lunch and Learns, including the ones we've done with Kate in the past. Thank you again for joining us and I will turn it over to you, Dr. McMahon, and we will get started. Awesome, thank you so much. Let me just share my screen here. Okay. Well, thank you so much um, to Kathleen and Will and Maine Conservation Voters for having me yet again. And thank you so much to everybody who is here, um, you know, all 239 of you right now um, at a lunchtime talk. That's really fantastic. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Captain Drinkwater, and I'm going to start just by giving um, a brief background on um, global slavery. So slavery touched nearly every continent on this planet. Um, it shaped the colonies that, that came out of you know, the European expansion of the 16th and 17th centuries. Um, and it really was driven by waterways, oceans, rivers, um, and other waterways were transportation for enslaved people. Um, and we begin to see in the right around 1500, in the late 15th century, um, a great dramatic increase in the slave trade to the Americas. And you can see here um, in this chart on the right hand side, this is derived from slavevoyages.org, um, which I'm an operational committee member of, um, and we're the largest database documenting um, the transoceanic slave trade. 
Um, so you can see over um, 40,000 voyages um, on the transatlantic slave trade, as well as intra-American slave trades. And we're also expanding now into the Indian Ocean, which will be um, available in the next few years. So this trade had an immense human toll. Um, the average mortality rate was around 15%. So about 15% of the 12 and a half million people that left Africa died in the slave trade. Um, so about that equates to about 1.8 million people that perished during the Middle Passage. However, at times this was much higher and the period in which I study the illegal slave trade, which is after 1808, um, has a generally much higher mortality rate due to um, a number of factors, which I'll get into later in the talk. So briefly, I'll just talk about Maine and the legal slave trade. Um, first, we know that there was a colonial market for enslaved people in York, at least by 1650. We only have a, a relatively small amount of evidence currently for Maine's role in the slave trade um, in, during the legal period prior to 1800. And this is a num because of a number of factors, um, because of a lack of study, um, lack of available archival evidence for this trade. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's likely a lot of this that will come to the surface in the next 10 years as more collections get digitized and we begin to reanalyze existing archival collections for evidence of trade in enslaved people. Um, but we certainly know that at least by 1750, enslaved people were being brought directly to the state of Maine and sold in the state of Maine. Um, this, this document on the top left-hand corner of the slide um, dates to 1752 on a slave ship called the Betsy, which brought um, enslaved people, an, an unknown number of enslaved people to Kittery for sale directly from Africa. So prior to the American Revolution, Massachusetts citizens made two attempts to stop the trade in enslaved Africans but these were not favored by the colonial governor and therefore went nowhere at the time. Rhode Island and Connecticut did pass resolutions barring the importation of enslaved Africans to their borders, but none of the colonial powers made any attempts at limiting the engagement of their citizens in this traffic, particularly elsewhere outside of, of the colonies, uh, especially to the Caribbean. It was not until 1787 that Rhode Island passed the first law in New England barring the participation of their citizens uh, trading enslaved people outside of the colonies, which levied a 1,000 pound fine for fitting out the vessel an additional 100 pounds per captive. Massachusetts and Connecticut followed with similar legislation in 1788. Um, however, as, as scholar Elizabeth Donnan notes, Quote, the legislative situation was confused by questions of jurisdiction and constitutionality, all of which tended to aid the slave trader and to increase the zeal of the abolitionists for federal rather than state action. So what we can see is that, um, you know, there was relatively few number of, of people that were actually prosecuted for engaging in the slave trade, and many merchants continued engaging in the slave trade uh, with what relative ease during this um, early Republican era and into the early 19th century. Um, and these are just a small handful of vessels that we have identified at slave voyages that were from Maine um, that were engaged in the intra-American slave trade, trading enslaved people from uh, ports in the Americas to places in the Caribbean, for example. Um, primarily during the, the mid and into the late 18th century. So what we do know, in addition to this, um, after the, during this time period, um, there was also a robust domestic slave trade. So a, a trade in enslaved people within the United States. And we know that uh, manners were were quite involved in this trade. 
Um, you can see on the, your screen two manifests for slave ships that breaks Susan Soul and Venus, which were owned by Rufus Soul, a shipbuilder and merchant from Freeport. Um, and these vessels were trading enslaved people in the 19, excuse me, 1840s and 1850s um, in between ports in the Upper South and in the Lower South. So between um, Charleston and New Orleans or New North Carolina and New Orleans. Um, and you can see on the screen, you know, one of the, the devastating facts of this is that entire families were traded during this time period. You can see here on the right-hand side aboard the brig Susan Soul, which is named after Rufus, Rufus's wife, um, three people, Caroline, who was 25, and her two children, six-year-old Godfrey, or excuse me, six-year-old Harry and one-year-old Godfrey. Um, so, you know, along with the people that they would in trade, they would be trading, they would also trade in commodities. So as part of their regular um, packets of sugar and cotton that they would trade between different ports along the coast of the United States, they would also be trading enslaved people. Um, and, you know, these two are just a couple of examples. Um, there are likely many more. Only a small portion of these manifests have actually been digitized. Um, and many have also just been lost due to disasters, particularly the, the manifests for the city of Boston were lost. Um, we may never know the full extent of New England's participation in the legal transportation of enslaved people uh, at, along the coastwise United States, but we do know that it was a significant component um, to the regular trading activities of New England's merchants. So the illegal slave trade, took place um, after 1808. In 1807, the British barred participation of their citizens in the trading of enslaved people and the transportation of enslaved Africans in particular to the shores of their colonies. So for the British in 1807, they barred um, ship merchants from bringing uh, enslaved people from Africa to their colonies. And, and in 1808, the United States followed suit. Um, there were a number of ships that landed in the United States after 1808. Um, however, it really it pales in comparison to the number of vessels that were American that were engaged in the transportation of Africans to other places, especially to Cuba and Brazil, which is what I'll be talking about today. And this is for a number of reasons. American ports had significant port authority presences, naval forces, um, you know, taxes and tariffs and other things that uh, really put, made it more difficult for merchants to bring enslaved people directly into the United States. Um, and it, of course, uh, enslaved people coming from Africa may not speak, would likely have not have spoken English or would have had an accent, and that also would have brought up, um, you know, significant suspicions on behalf of authorities as to the origins of these people. Um, but it really didn't suppress Americans, this 1808 law did not suppress Americans from participating in the slave trade after 1808 in any significant way. Um, so subsequently, between 1808 and 1820, and uh, several more laws were passed that increased the penalties for Americans that were charged with participating in the slave trade until finally the Act of 1820, um, it made participation in the slave trade piracy and therefore capital offense. However, only one person was ever fully brought up to the and punished um, by the Act of 1820, um, and that was Nathaniel Gordon, who was also from Portland, um, and he was convicted in 1861 and executed in early 1862, essentially at the behest of Abraham Lincoln, who wanted to put a stop to the trade. So Frederick Drinkwater, um, uh, Frederick Augustus Drinkwater was born on August 3rd, 1817 in Portland. And he was the son of ship captain David Drinkwater Jr., who was part of the famous Drinkwater family of North Yarmouth. 
The drink waters were wealthy, connected maritime men and ship captains. Frederick married Jane B. Milliken, who was the daughter of David's business colleague at the Bank of Cumberland, Weston Milliken in 1842. They settled into a home at 91 Cumberland Avenue in Portland. They also lived for a time on Park Avenue. Um, and, uh, you know, Frederick started off just working as a ship captain involved in what seemed to be normal coastwise trade between Portland and Boston and Point South, uh, including two sites in the Caribbean. But by 1850, he was deeply involved in the slave trade to Cuba, working on behalf of Maine merchants and ship owners. <clears throat> so the first vessel that he captained under suspicious circumstances was the Bark Chieftain, a 253-ton uh, vessel launched by Rufus Soule in Freeport in 1849. And I'll just pause here to note that tonnage essentially means the amount of cargo that a vessel could carry. It doesn't mean that the boat itself weighed 253 tons. The bark was consigned, meaning leased, to the American Colonization Society, um, which was a society formed to bring free Black people back to Africa. It was formed in the early 19th century, but by this time period, um, essentially, it was being utilized to force people who were free in the United States to leave the United States. Um, particularly in southern states, it um, there were a number of states that passed laws barring freed uh, enslaved people from living there, um, and it, essentially they did not want free African Americans to inspire rebellion or revolt uh, on the same level as what they had seen, for example, in Harper's Ferry or what they had seen in um, in uh, Haiti, for example. So um, the American Colonization Society consigned the chieftain to bring these freed people um, who belonged to the estate of Jacob Wood Esquire, who was a lawyer in Georgia, um, to Liberia in, in February, 1850. It made at least three trips on behalf of the American Colonization Society between 1850 and 1853. Um, transporting upwards of at least 500 people to Liberia, whether they wanted to go or not. And I should reinforce here that this was not a uh, journey that these people made of their own free will. They were forced to go to Liberia. <clears throat> the chieftain was implicated in slave trading in 1852. Um, you can see here, uh, it returned after having gone on this original journey to Liberia in 1850, it returned by way of Havana, loaded with silver and gold and no cargo to the port of New York City. Um, so very likely at this point, Drinkwater made a successful slave trading journey. After having left Liberia, he likely purchased enslaved people in Liberia or elsewhere in West Africa, sold them in Havana, and then made his way back to Maine. Um, so, and, you know, there's a, there's a good amount of evidence to suggest that this was a slave trading journey that was su successful for him. <clears throat> So um, this really set the tone for what would become the rest of his career. Um, he made connections in Liberia and began to become a favorite captain in the recruitment of New England slave ships for the Cuban slave trade in the 1850s. Between 1850 and 1860, he was the registered captain of the following slave ships, the Chieftain, the Susan Soul, the Florina, the Gambia, the Cosmopolitan, the Abbott Devereux, the Minnetonka, the Joseph H. Record, the R.B. Lawton, the Niagara, the Brahmin, and the Minnetonka. He was also the captain of several other vessels that were operating suspiciously during the late 1840s and early 1850s, including several which were struck by devastating yellow fever outbreaks, a likely sign of being engaged in the slave trade. <clears throat> 
By 1857, Drinkwater had even partially re relocated to Havana and was working directly with Spanish and Portuguese slave traders that were operating between New York, Boston, and Havana. His activities were so blatant and unchecked that despite the knowledge of American and British authorities, he did not suffer any legal consequences. Um, so here's a, a couple of quotes. This one is from um, the, the British Parliamentary Papers. It is well known some months ago that an American who passed by the name of Captain Drinkwater and stated himself to belong to Portland in the state of Maine was engaged in the purchase of fast sailing vessels, that he bought a number of them here, which were supposed to be intended for the slave trade, and several of those purchased by him have subsequently been fallen in with and been captured and condemned on the coast of Africa. And another quote from the American authorities, quote, the Mr. Frederick A. Drinkwater at the time he became the apparent purchaser of the Minnetonka, George H. Record, R.B. Lawton, Niagara, and Brahmin was in the employ of, or in some way connected to, in, uh, in business with Mr. Antonio Cabarga, who was a prominent Spanish slave trader in Havana. Others noted, quote, it is well known that some months ago that an American, oh, excuse me, already read that, um, the vessels themselves were disposed of because of the amount of wealth being accumulated by captains, builders, and merchants back in New England, as well as port authorities who were bribed to look the other way. From the New York Herald, April 1st, 1857. It is estimated that the slave fleet, which leaves New York, Boston, New Bedford, Portland, and other Eastern seaports in a single year, numbers some 40 vessels of different sizes, bearing from 100 to 400 tons, and capable of carrying from three to 600 slaves. Each vessel is manned by crews from 15 to 25 men, including the captain and officers, making a total for the whole fleet of about 1,000 men. The whole of the capital invested does not probably exceed $4 million, upon which, as we have shown, a profit of 11 millions is realized. The relative value of $11 million in today's currency is a staggering $353 million. The Herald's estimation is actually quite low when we examine the evidence of the total numbers of vessels engaged in this trade from New England. These millions of dollars flowed back to New England and helped establish New England's slave society, which was not rooted at home, but rather in Cuba and in Brazil. These merchants' political and social power helped to shape New England as a white place while establishing some moral superiority over Southern slaveholders. New England's role in this horrific period of the slave trade, where mortality rates were often double or higher than that of the legal period, is one that be, must be reckoned with. The vessel pictured here is the schooner Abbott Devereux, which was a small 113-ton schooner that went to Ouida in modern-day Benin in 1857. It was owned by Drinkwater. Of this journey, newspapers reported, quote, a Portland, man in the, a Portland man in the slave trade, the Havana correspondent of the New York Tribune under the date of October 8th says that a cargo of slaves has been landed at San Juan de la Remedios from the brig Abbott Devereux, which ostensibly belonged to an American flying under the name of Drinkwater, a Portland man who purchased and cleared several other vessels. The Devereux landed her cargo without any difficulty, numbering nearing, near, nearly 400 souls, and was destroyed. It is stated that the captain of the brig received $30,000 for the round voyage. The writer adds, the J.H. Record, formerly of Newport and also of Commander Drinkwater's fleet, is considered as having landed her cargo. For this, I cannot vouch as yet, though I do not consider it at all improbable. And so in this diagram, you can see uh, how absolutely horrific the conditions for these enslaved people were on board this vessel when it was captured off of Sierra Leone. Um, they, they noted that um, their, the hold was only three feet six high, so barely enough room for people on board the vessel to sit up, let alone to stand. Um, and they were packed, absolutely packed. Uh, aboard the ship when it was captured in October 1857, having um, two, over 200 people on board. 
So slavery really was a building uh, block of the New England economy, and the slave trade played an important role in this. Um, this middle middle clip from a Portland advertiser from 1857 states, slave vessels, three of the slave vessels recently captured and taken into Havana are said to have been built with Boston and Portland capital. And when captured, people were on board as officers and part of crews. Another of the vessels had been owned by parties in Massachusetts, Maine, and New York, and was sold with the knowledge that she was intended for the slave trade. One had 460 Africans on board and another 116. Let not the slave oligarchy despair. So long as Northern men can be found to carry on the African slave trade, there will be no difficulty in keeping up a pro-slavery political party at the North under the stimulus of the spoils of office. So really this is an indictment of how deeply implicated New Englanders were in the slave trade and continuing um, the economies of enslavement during this time period. And so, as I stated earlier, um, Maine's, Maine's timber, in, uh, Maine's slave fleet was estimated as having been worth uh, at least $11 million by the New York Times in, in 1854. Um, and the relative value of that is around $332 million today, though more than likely this is far too small. What we understand um, by looking at the numbers of people that I have calculated is that Mainers or main built ships transported at least 20,866 period uh, people during the period um, between 1850 and 1865 alone. The average number of captives on board each ship was 647. The average sale price was $400 or $12,000 per person in today's money. The profits for the known journeys are at least $151 million in today's money. And the average net profits for the owners, what was flowing back per journey for uh, each vessel was $3.1 million in today's money or $100,000 at the time. And so when we think about what is the relative value of this in comparison to, let's say, the timber industry, um, our value, the value of our timber industry in uh, 1854, uh, excuse me, 1852 was $2.5 million. So therefore, our slave ship fleet was nearly four times more valuable than the timber industry in 1850s. Um, and, you know, obviously some of that money is actually flowing back into these slave ships as well. So the timber industry and the slave ship industry and uh, the economies of enslavement are deeply tied together. So these were really foundational to the New England economy. So as I said, approximately 20,866 captives um, were embarked in Africa around what I have numbers for, 19,156 people landed in Cuba during this time period um, at, with a mortality rate of at least 7%. And I know this is a very small diagram uh, here, but uh, you can see that I only actually have figures that I've been able to calculate for about half of these voyages. Um, these really, uh, this is really marks the tip of the iceberg. And I want to stress that what you see here are vessels that were caught. So these are only people that were caught by the British authorities, by the American authorities. Um, there is a whole iceberg underneath this of people who, who made off in this economy and were never captured, were never caught. Uh, people would not have taken these risks had there not been immense profits um, and a likelihood of, of success available to them. Um, and what we see here is, uh, what we don't see here is the, the massive amounts of resistance that occurred uh, by enslaved people aboard these vessels. Um, at least one in 10 of these ships had some sort of revolt on board, some sort of active violent resistance to enslavement. Um, some of these vessels 
also transported people to the United States, which I've talked about in, in past talks. Um, and those people aboard those vessels resisted their enslavement, um, testified at trials, um, you know, spoke loudly about the conditions in which they suffered. And, um, you know, I think I'll, I'll close up this section of the talk just to say that really we need to reckon with how deeply complicit the region is with the economies of enslavement and with the slave trade. Um, we have not really addressed this chapter of our history, particularly when we think about the age of sail um, and maritime history, we tend to make it a very heroic time period, particularly for Maine's history. It's something we're very proud of, but we have not sufficiently complicated what that history meant for non-white or non-elite people. Um, and so I think it's important for us to begin to really unpack this history, um, to, to devote more resources to this history, and to really push for a better understanding of how uh, histories like this really shaped the region and helped create the extremely white state that Maine still is today. Uh, many of these people were, were high status individuals. They had, um, uh, you know, they were city aldermen, they were uh, judges, lawyers, bankers, prominent landowners, uh, and, and therefore used their power to disenfranchise people of color. And I should also um, note that Frederick Drinkwater never suffered a single legal consequence as a result of his actions. Um, he died peacefully at home at the age of 77 um, after having liver cancer. Um, so, you know, I, th I think that shows you, despite the fact that this was, his activities were well known to British and American th authorities, he did not suffer any consequences and nor did the vast majority of the, the people that you see on this list, only a small handful suffered any consequences. And those that did other than Nathaniel Gordon only suffered consequences such as a fine and maybe a small amount of jail time, days, not years, um, for the immense human suffering and death that they were responsible for. And so, um, I will will open up to questions now. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, it is it is hard to hear this history and hard to to reckon with it, and um, absolutely imperative that we do. So, thank you for for sharing what you've learned, and we've got a ton of questions but but before we get to those i want to share a couple of ways that that we can take what we're learning today and what we're hearing today and continue that learning um the first is an invitation to support the work of the place justice initiative uh, don't worry about jotting this down. You will get a follow-up email later this afternoon with both uh, a link to this recording and information about these, these follow-up calls to action. Um, but just so you know, Place Justice is a statewide truth-seeking and historical recovery initiative that's led by the Permanent Commission on the Status of Racial, Indigenous, and Tribal Populations. It invites people across the state to examine our, our landscape and our practices through the, the lens of racial history. As I said, we'll share uh, a little more information about the Police Justice Initiative and the, the information to join in the first of an eight-part series of panel discussions. Uh, that's gonna, the first one starts on Tuesday, at this coming Tuesday, February 7th, and it will feature Speaker of the Main House, Rachel Talbot Ross, and Penobscot Tribal Ambassador Molly and Dana, talking about four decades and four bills dealing with offensive names and symbols in Maine. When you get this follow-up email and you, you click on that registration info, you will see a, um, a map that I suspect will will shock you uh, that includes some of the, the offensive names that are still 
still on our maps and still part of our state landscape. So, you know, we're going to be exploring place justice even more next month um, when we have the opportunity to host Dr. Meadow Dibble and Erica Arthur. They are the amazing forces behind the initiative, and you, you won't yet see registration information for that March 3rd Lunch and Learn on our website, but we promise to keep you posted and, uh, and hope to see you then. In the meantime, you probably caught at the beginning of the program that this is our third program with, with Kate. And if this one blew your mind, I invite you to go back and, and check out the previous programs. We will share uh, the links to those, one about Maine and the slave trade, and one about the historic African-American community of Peterborough. Um, Kate, I don't know if I told you that after that program, you inspired me to, to take load my family up in the car and go explore the Peterborough Cemetery. So it is a, a really fascinating way to get a, a hands-on look and understanding of our, our shared history. Uh, these are just three of, of actually quite a number of Lunch and Learns that we've done with a, a sort of racial justice and equity lens. And in fact, on our, our YouTube channel, you can sort by playlist. And there is a racial justice playlist uh, that is just a treasure trove of, of information and advocacy and, and opportunities to get involved in, in understanding our shared history and making our shared future more just and equitable. So I invite you to check that out as well. And um, Thank you for all of the amazing questions. Let's let's dig into them. Uh, Pete, as I said, it's it's really hard to hear this history, but but given that it is our history, why didn't we know about it? I didn't learn any of this stuff in school. Is is that an oversight? Is that something? Yeah, tell us what's going on here. You know, I think uh, some of it comes from. Uh, the late 19th century when when a lot of our history was it, it became very popular to record town histories um you know that's when you see a lot of the most famous town histories come out um you know the founding of many of our historical societies occurred in the late 19th century such as the main historical society um what we see is a a deliberate washing of the hands of any ties to slavery. Um, people did not really want to, I think, associate themselves with, with this history in particular um, per, because of the Civil War. Uh, so we see, you know, essentially we wanted to, the region wanted to distance itself from its relationship with slavery. And um, particularly this, this, period of the slave trade, the illegal slave trade, has multifaceted reasons why people wouldn't want to implicate themselves with something that was illegal, with something that was so horrific, um, with the transportation of all of these different people. I think it, um, you know, is something that we as a region have yet to reckon with, and even as a country, um, you know, Maine obviously wasn't alone in its involvement in the slave trade um, during this time period or, or the whole history of the slave trade. Um, but New England was of the vessels that I have identified um, that were engaged in the slave trade during this time period, just the years between 1850 and essentially 1862, 65 of 200 of them were from Maine. So I think that is is pretty telling that how deeply invested New England was um, and and another, you know, 50 or so, or so were from Massachusetts. So, you know, more than half of of these vessels were from northern New England, not from southern states. And those are just the vessels I've been able to identify. And it, it's quite tricky to do this research because of the fact that it was illegal. We don't have slave ship manifests. We don't have insurance records. Um, there's a lot of evidence of um, captains intentionally destroying evidence, uh, throwing their entire captain's chest overboard when, when the British Navy or the American Navy would pull up to them while they were in Africa. Um, so, 
So the records are much different than what we would normally look at for the legal period of, of slavery and for general merchant shipping. Uh, they just don't exist. So uh, it, it can be difficult to get to, to the full, you know, who owns the ship, who's the captain of the ship, who's the crew of the ship. Um, and often they would even change the names. So some of these ships um, that you would have seen on, on my list have like three names associated with them because they change the name after each slave trading journey. Um, and they talk in, in the British parliamentary records or in the uh, American congressional records about um, names being painted over or scraped off or you know the vessels being painted black in order to hide the true identities of the vessels and its owners so it can be very difficult um although i will say that despite this a lot of this was, was fairly easily accessible to me um you know a lot of this information is sitting in these in these congressional papers. It's sitting in the British parliamentary papers, which are available for free use on Google Books. Um, you know, a lot of this is in our newspapers. You saw a lot of the information about drink water, for example, came from the New York Times, the the Herald. You know, prominent newspapers that we still still look at and read today. So, um, you know, this this wasn't really a secret at the time. We have just there has been intentional, I think, revision to to try to distance the region's history from from this. We so often look back at our history and say, you know, well, it was a different time, but it it sounds that sort of intentional that intentional hiding really kind of shows the hand, right? That, that there was an awareness that this was was not only illegal, but but immoral and wrong and and that we didn't want to claim it as our history even though it clearly is one of the one of the questions we've got here is you know would it be possible to get a copy of the list of vessels and and who captained them and and it sounds like from what you said it's both both easy and hard <laughs> do you do you have suggestions for for people who are looking to sure. do this research themselves yeah, um, my list is available on Atlantic Black Box's website. So if you go to AtlanticBlackBox.com, I think it's .com, um, you can find, yes, dot, uh, yes, dot com. Um, you can find the list. It's up there. Um, so anybody can download it and look at it. Um, I am constantly updating and revising it. Um, the one that's up there might not be my most recent version, but essentially, you know, I think there's, there's a lot of, uh, it, it really isn't particularly difficult to do this history, uh, just type of historical research, if you know, you know, the kind of search terms to look for. Um, and, uh, you know, you can scour newspaper databases by just searching main slave trade, and putting in a time period and stuff will pop up and uh, the same thing goes for google books so you can if you can you can search for your town you can search for an individual that way it can be a little bit more difficult when you know some of some of of course some of this research does come from archives um it comes from the main historical society um you know vassal borough historical society i've been all over the state to all of these little and large historical societies um as well as the library of congress there's there's quite a lot of information in the law library of the library of congress uh, about this this story uh, this history uh, particularly for the folks that were brought up on charges um as well as uh you know the national archives so uh, some of that has been digitized some of it has not been digitized um but i certainly am happy to share i i think that this history belongs to everybody and that i you know do not claim ownership over it or any one of these stories and i i think it's just important that we you know, begin to to reckon with and understand, um, you know, how this has been generationally passed down. 
Thank you. And we will we will include a link to that Atlantic Black Box project in that follow up email this afternoon as well, and let you know that um, that that's a project that that Dr. Meadow Dibble, who mentioned, connected to the Place Justice Initiative. Um, she's also a, a force behind the the Atlantic Black Box project, and we were we're lucky enough to host her for a lunch and loan learn program as well. So you're just going to get all sorts of goodies this afternoon and have lots of lots of things to explore. Um, I'm curious if if there's, you know, it sounds like there have been some projects. Um, I'm not familiar th with this, but I bet you are traces of the trade in Rhode Island um, that with with families trying to recognize and, and look for their role in their families' roles in this history. Is there anything like that happening in, in Maine? And would you suggest that the, the same sort of process that you recommend to anybody applies to people who's, who maybe recognize some of the names? I, I've definitely had um, descendants of certain families reach out to me, um, particularly the family of Cyrus Libby, who was a uh, who was the captain of a slave ship called the Porpoise, which was um, implicated in the slave trade in 1845 to Brazil. Um, and, you know, I, I would recommend, you know, essentially the same process. Uh, if you're, if you're curious about what, if you think that, you know, your family was involved in this, you know, doing some basic genealogical research, and then also looking into things like, um, the shipping news. I have spent a lot, way more time than any human being should reading shipping news. <laughs> um, and, you know, but you can learn a lot about the activities. Uh, it, it provides really important clues as to the activities of a vessel, of where it's going, and the captain of that vessel. Um, so, you know, each time a vessel enters a port or exit, exits a port, generally it's recorded in the shipping news in the newspaper. And um, it also provides sometimes, you know, if, if a vessel is sighted at sea, you know, one vessel report, I sighted such and such vessel off of, you know, someplace. Um, so that can help provide clues as to where you, where that vessel is headed and what it's up to. Um, in this illegal period, it can be difficult. And obviously, you know, newspaper records get better the further into the 19th century you go. So, you know, the earlier you're looking, it gets harder and harder to find actual documentary evidence. Um, but certainly I think it's important for, for folks, if, if you think you have information or if you want to share anything with me, I would be more than happy to take that. Every time you say the word illegal, it just, screams out in my my head this was not not sanctioned by the law right this was illegal activity was there anybody speaking out against the illegal slave trade in Maine at the time absolutely um you know there were a number and particularly black abolitionists living in the city of portland um, Reuben Ruby and others um, who were associated with with him and his group that were heavily against the illegal slave trade. Um, in the Liberator newspaper, we see routinely, very often, probably every issue of the newspaper, there is a report about an illegal slave trading vessel and a strong condemnation of, of people participating in it. Um, I haven't come across you know, I certainly have seen in in newspapers editorials um, from the editorial staffs of various newspapers in Maine and elsewhere coming out strongly against men like Drinkwater um, who were engaged in the slave trade. You saw sort of a couple of examples of those um, in my talk. So, you know, there there were absolutely people who were against this work uh, that they were engaged in and people who were strongly speaking out against the slave trade and you know that was really being spearheaded by black abolitionists from northern new england who were um you know writing about speaking out against the slave trade um and the continuation of it <laughs> 
it's such a, a balance as we as we reckon with difficult history. We don't want to turn away from from how widespread and and accepted this was, but we also don't want to forget that there was a, a strong resistance even at the time. So thank you. That's that's really helpful. Uh, that that slide with the the economic data and what this meant in terms of of dollars for Maine's economy, uh, really overwhelming. I'm curious if there was also commerce in in bribes to evade capture and prosecutions, or you know, what was the what's the other what's the rest of the story of that economic sure. impact? Absolutely. There was a huge network of bribery in basically every port. Um, so, you know, in ports in Africa, there were were people who were bribed, um, you know, naval naval authorities were bribed um, when you got back to the United States. There were uh, a number of, for example, in, in, in New York City, um, there's one vessel I've spoken about previously um, were called the Transit. It was captained by a man from Vassalboro called Ebenezer Farwell. Um, and he actually brought three enslaved Africans with him back to, to the port of New York City. Um, and it, David Ruggles, who was a prominent Black abolitionist in the city of New York at that time, uh, found these men, had heard about them, went and rescued them, essentially. Um, and they essentially he implicates the the port authorities in turning a blind eye to this that he they knew before he even left that um that farwell was going to go to africa to purchase enslaved people and so you know we see this pretty much everywhere it was a, a ubiquitous bribery and then there's also this other level of Judges are often appointed by whichever president is president. And of course, we know um, during the 1830s to the 1850s, there were a number of pro-slavery presidents um, and, or presidents that were certainly apathetic to ending slavery. And so therefore, the judges that they appointed and um, the, the criminal justice system was heavily biased in favor of the the captains and the owners, et cetera. So what we see is essentially over and over and over again, when these men are brought up on charges for the most obvious cases of slave trading, like where there is, uh, for example, with the porpoise, there was three enslaved boys, children, who were brought to the United States to, to testify against him. And eventually he is acquitted charges are dismissed because they don't have enough evidence that basically he says that he gave them their freedom and they say absolutely not we are not free we were not free we were to be the the slaves of this slave trader so you know there is um there is a a level of of real apathy on behalf of the criminal justice system in order to not prosecute this until essentially Lincoln comes into office and he says, you know, this period be between like 1854 and 1862 was absolutely a huge increase in, in the slave trade to Cuba. So it's a dramatic rise in the number of vessels, American vessels that are engaged in the slave trade and the numbers of people that are being transported to Cuba in order to work on sugar plantations. And and Lincoln wants to put a stop to it because he sees, you know, number one, this is abhorrent and horrible. And the reports that are coming out, especially since, you know, at this time period, vessels are getting much larger. So you're seeing like 800, 900, 1,000 enslaved people aboard a vessel because of there are these huge clipper ships now that are being taken into, taken into the slave trade. Uh, that's one reason. And the other reason, of course, is it does his anti-slavery cause no good to have northerners engaged in the slave trade uh elsewhere and it's something it's a hypocrisy that was routinely called out by southern politicians in congress and in different newspaper editorials and and, and things like that so you know the southern slaveholders were using it as like well how can you all try to say 
you're anti-slavery when you're doing this and you're invested in this. So, um, you know, essentially that's why eventually, you know, Lincoln pushes for the execution of Nathaniel Gordon and the, the full stop of the slave trade. And, you know, at the same time, of course, in, in the early 1860s, maritime trade in general becomes very complicated with blockades and, you know, Confederate attacks and all of that stuff. So it was a combination of, of things that eventually put a stop to the slave trade. That, that interplay of the, the economics and the, the social dynamics and, and the politics is, is just so fascinating. And again, I'm just struck by the fact that that this was well known, and that it was being called out, um, you know, maybe not, maybe not with the best of intentions by those southern southern lawmakers, but but it was being named. Uh, and I'm curious, you know, given that it was intentionally forgotten for for so long, do you know, like, are main schools and universities teaching teaching this history now? teaching about Maine's role in the slave trade? Um, well, you know, there is ongoing work in certain school systems to incorporate this history. I know the city of Portland has been doing that. I have spoken to, um, you know, Yarmouth uh, high school students in the past. So there are, uh, there's also, of course, the, the work being done by Representative Talbot Ross um, in order to mandate this curriculum in schools, African-American history curriculum. Um, but I would say that 95% of schools in Maine are probably not teaching this history yet. Um, it's basically district by district right now as to who has adopted this type of uh, curriculum to be taught in schools. At the university level, I'm not 100% sure. I'm, I've been out of Maine for about 10 years now, <laughs> living in Baltimore and working in DC. So, but uh, I do know that some universities, you know, Bates and Bowdoin have been recently exploring their um, connections, the connections of their founders to slavery and the economies of enslavement. Um, I know that um, there is at least one professor at the University of Maine, Orono, who is doing this work. And of course, um, there's been some really great ongoing work at the University of Southern Maine with uh, within the history department and the anthropology departments there um, to do this work. But there still is plenty of room for for this to be something that is continually studied. Um, I don't know of anybody else who is specifically studying the illegal slave trade, or even the slave trade in general. Um, so, you, you know, there's there's definitely ongoing work about slavery in Maine, though, that is really compelling and really important, um, particularly for those who are descended of the enslaved or enslavers. Given how much work and research and learning there still is to be done, we are, are even more grateful that you're taking the time to share your research with us, Kate, and and really grateful to everybody who has joined this program today and is is stepping up to to look at this history and ask what we can do uh, to to learn from it, to bend the arc in a in a more just and equitable direction. Uh, as as I've said a couple of times, you will get a follow up email this afternoon with tons of resources and really encourage you to, to take the time to explore those. Feel free to forward that on to, to friends and family and neighbors and, and share what you're learning today. Uh, if you have questions, there are more questions than we had time to, to get to today, but if you have questions that you want to to share with us, we can make sure they make their way to, uh, to Dr. McMahon. Also, if you have ideas for, for programs that you'd like to see, uh, exploring means history around racial justice and equity or, or anything else, uh, we have a pretty broad, uh, broad sort of approach to this lunch and learn time. And as evidence of that, next week, we're gonna be talking about the roadmap to develop offshore wind development in the Gulf of Maine. Uh, very different topic, 
very important to our, our shared future together. That roadmap was developed through uh, an 18 month stakeholder process that was led by the governor's energy office. And uh, we're gonna have both the, the deputy director of the governor's energy office, Selena Cunningham, and the offshore wind program manager, Stephanie Watson with us to, to walk through the roadmap and, and tell us what happens next. And I, I hope we'll, we'll see you then. I hope we will see you again in March when we dig into place justice and um, stay warm out there, you guys. I it's going to be a it's going to be a brutal weekend but got lots of good things to keep you busy exploring from the from the comfort of your warm homes. Kate, thank you so much. Everyone have a wonderful wonderful weekend.